Hi, and welcome to Blogging Heads. Uh, I'm Kevin Glass, Managing Editor with Townhall.com, and I am here with... Francesca Chambers of Red Alert Politics. Great, and um, we're here to discuss some of, primarily some of the developments that are going on with gay marriage uh, as it relates to some of the court cases that have been going on this week, and specifically as kind of the conservative movement relates to these developments. Um, and Francesca, I don't know about you, but for me, over about the past month or so, it's kind of been an unprecedented wave of talking to other conservatives and activists about gay marriage um, with what seems like CPAC's annual uh, controversy now about Go Proud and allowing co-sponsorship from conservative gay groups um, with Rob Portman coming out for gay marriage after saying that his son uh, is gay. And now with these two court cases that are happening this week, um, we heard arguments in Hollingsworth v. Perry yesterday. By the time this post, we'll probably hear, have heard arguments in United States v. Windsor. Um, so I don't know about you, but it seems like a, a wave of at least, if not, you know, um, motion on the issue by conservatives, at least it's kind of been pushed to the forefront recently. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the conservatives, though, that they're driving this narrative. I really do think it is the left and I think the mainstream media that's more driving this narrative than anything else. Now, granted, you know, Rob Portman, he did come out for gay marriage, and that was one thing. But as you could see at CPAC, um, it was less the conservatives who were trying to talk about gay marriage, and more it seemed like the media who were trying to bait conservatives into talking about gay marriage. That's, I mean, it's certainly true, you know. Um, we saw at the court yesterday the um, both pro- pro-gay marriage and anti-gay marriage kind of rallies that were going on. Um, and depending on how these court cases work out, it's going to have a fairly large impact on the gay marriage debate going forward. Um, I don't know about you, but I kind of, in talking to some of the conservative activists at CPAC uh, and the younger conservative activists at CPAC, feel like there's, is, I mean, I think you're right that they're not really driving that conversation, but they're not really stopping it either, um, at least well, among I, the younger set. Well, I think it's hard to stop that conversation at this point when, like you mentioned, there's the two Supreme Court cases that are being heard this week. Yesterday, we saw uh, the first one, which was about Proposition 8 in California, and today, the second one, which is about uh, the Defense of Marriage Act. I mean, that's going to be in the news and if conservatives want to have an impact on this debate, there's really no way to avoid it at this point. And I think that that's key <laughs> at this point. Uh, and that's why you see so many conservatives out there on the steps of the Supreme Court fighting for marriage yesterday. Uh, conservatives had a march to the Supreme Court from the National Mall uh, in defense of marriage. Uh, so I definitely don't think this is one of those times where you see only people who are on one side out in front of the court, i.e. liberals who do an excellent job of protesting and conservatives aren't as always great at protesting. Uh, there definitely seems like there's a lot of support for traditional marriage coming from conservatives who are also out there protesting. Right, and I think that even the conservatives who are relatively pro-gay marriage uh, are conflicted on these court cases, especially on the Proposition 8 court case, where... Um, there's definitely a potential for a really wide-ranging and sweeping ruling from the Supreme Court. Um, and obviously conservatives are kind of the ones who have in the past been wary of judicial activism. And the possibility that the Supreme Court could say, you know, Proposition 8 is unconstitutional because we find in the 14th Amendment uh, constitutional protection for homosexuality and for gay marriage would basically legalize gay marriage in every single state in the United States, which um, I think even the pro-gay marriage conservatives are kind of hesitant about. But yeah, it's obviously, a, yeah, I was uh, going to say it's an interesting debate. 
Um, yeah, certainly. But obviously, the you know, the National Organization for Marriage, their protest yesterday was as large, if not larger, than um, every other group that was having rallies out there. So it's not like, you know, the conservative movement is united in one way or another on this. In fact, um, although, I, although I would say that we've seen more and more conservative movement on the issue, uh, conservatives are still very, very pro-traditional marriage. And I think that that's true. Uh, conservatives are not united on this issue. Just last night, my fiancé and I were having a debate for an hour about whether or not, you know, the Supreme Court would strike it down, what they would rule, the constitutionality of it, and we could not come to an agreement. Not because we disagree about gay marriage. We have the same exact view. We just couldn't come to an agreement on whether or not it was constitutional and specifically how individual justices would rule. And there's so many factors here, especially because there's two very different cases that are being discussed but could, depending on the ruling, uh, have essentially the same exact effect, which would be to allow gay marriage uh, and essentially allow it in every state by allowing it in the two cases that are being discussed. So there is a wide range of outcomes that could happen, and I think it's really tough at this point to know what the court is going to rule and what those those effects will be of the ruling. As far as the, the conservatives who are out there uh, really acting on this issue, I think it's very interesting because... I think that in public you tend to see more of the traditional marriage conservatives who are uh, the ones who are out there protesting, but you don't as much see the younger people who I would generally say are more pro-gay marriage out there protesting. The young people, the, one in the, cons the ones in the conservative movement who either just really aren't that passionate about this issue or think that there should be gay marriage, it's just, it's just not something that they get super fired up about, right? Enough to go out there and make a big scene about it for the most part. And so I think that's why you're sort of not seeing that whole other part of the conservative movement. I actually would say, uh, you know, I watched the, the National Organization for Marriage Rally. They did a fairly good job of getting kind of young conservatives who did care about the issue as prominent speakers at their rally. Um, but I think that you're right in general that, you know, you and I are kind of connected in the D.C. conservative movement. Um, we both were at CPAC, and at CPAC there's a huge college student contingent and, in general, just kind of young activist contingent. And you don't see that, that passion for traditional marriage that you do see among kind of older legacy conservative movement uh, institutions in, in Washington. Um, but I do think that uh, that the there was an article in the New York Times uh, the other day on the potential for a wide sweeping Proposition 8 ruling to kind of galvanize at least what's left of the very strongly pro-traditional marriage conservative movement um, and kind of making an analogy with Roe v. Wade in which, you know, when Roe was decided uh, it was going, uh, a legalization of abortion was going state by state. I think there were six or seven uh, states at the time of Roe v. Wade that had at least partially legalized abortion. Um, and then Roe v. Wade comes out and it's legalized everywhere in every single state. Um, and as the narrative goes, that kind of galvanized the pro-life movement and that, cre that basically created the modern day pro-life movement that we see today. Um, do you think that there's a potential in a sweeping uh, opinion by the Supreme Court to galvanize conservative activists against gay marriage and against the Supreme Court? Well, to start with the Supreme Court ruling, I, there's a potential for it, but I don't think it's likely given uh, the justices' reaction in court yesterday, the first day of the hearings. It seemed that the Supreme Court did not want to have a sweeping ruling, and that was coming from justices who you would otherwise think would be swing votes or would be on the side of gay marriage. So when you've lost them on the issue at this time, then it's hard for me to believe that there will be any sort of sweeping ruling. That being said, I don't think that gay marriage is anything like Roe versus Wade for the simple reason that it's pretty easy, even if you are pro-choice, 
to, uh, I guess, get you on board with the pro the pro-life, I guess, rhetoric, because it's really hard to fight against people who are claiming that you're murdering children. And with gay marriage, it's it's not the same. <laughs> you know, there's not some really evil act, right, that's going on here. I mean, maybe some conservatives would say so, but it's certainly not on the level of murder. And so even if, you know, gay marriage were legalized, it would be really hard for conservatives nationally to then create a really big national opposition to it that would be really effective, I think, um, in convincing people to come over to their side. So I just don't think it's, it's, like, it's like abortion in that sense. Right, and I think you saw uh, Justice Scalia yesterday in questioning um, the the pro gay marriage side. He said, uh, you know, he has no opinion on the utility of gay marriage as it relates to raising children, um, mm. and that used to be the conservative movement's kind of big issue was that you know gay, we don't know the effect that gay marriage will have on on how families raise children. Um, and I think that both the academic literature and popular opinion is, is swaying against that now um, to the point where we have prominent conservatives who say, well, I'm not sure about, I'm not even sure if it, is, if it would be a bad thing for children, but I'm still hesitant to agree with it. Well, the other thing that I think conservatives have relied on in the past is that the Bible clearly states that gay marriage, well, that being gay is a sin, not gay marriage. It doesn't talk about that specifically, but it, it does say that being gay is a sin. So I think a lot of very social religious conservatives are still very stuck on that point that it's against the Bible. But then as I've heard other conservatives argue uh, recently, you know, you ha if you're for, for separation of church and state, you also can't cling to the Bible as a reason not to do something. And not every person in America believes in, you know, the specific same Bible as perhaps some of the social conservatives. They believe in, you know, other religions and other things. So it, it's, it's tough, I think, for conservatives to continue arguing against against gay marriage on some of the reasons that they've been very successful for arguing against it in the past. And I think that by continuing to fight it so vehemently, all that they'll do is reinforce the stereotype that Republicans and conservatives, you know, they're old, they're stuck in the past, they, they aren't with the times, etc., that really seemed to hurt the movement and Republicans in the last presidential election. And I'm not saying that Republicans are stuck in the past and that social conservatives, by saying, no, we believe in traditional marriage, are stuck in the past, but that happens to be, I think, a very popular view of their position on the issue, unfortunately. I think that's true. What I do think, actually, when it comes to kind of making a, a broad-sweeping uh opinion from the court, I think that it would have the potential to not exactly galvanize the conservative movement as a whole, um, but let's say that in, uh, in Hollingsworth v. Perry that the Supreme Court says that the 14th Amendment says that uh, gay marriage must be legal if straight marriage is legal. Um, I think that the combination of kind of the judicial activism aspect of a ruling like that with, uh, obviously, the anti-traditional marriage aspect uh, would, cause a would cause a kind of unification in the conservative movement against that opinion specifically. Um, so, you know, younger conservatives are okay with gay marriage. You know, you look at the polls, uh, are increasingly okay with gay marriage, um, but they're not okay with judicial activism. And older conservatives obviously are not okay with gay marriage and not okay with judicial activism. So I think that a, a sweeping opinion in, uh, in Hollingsworth v. Perry would probably have the potential to make uh, at least that court case an issue for, you know, 10 or 15 years. I don't think that it would be on the magnitude that Roe v. Wade has been. Um, but I certainly think that there's potential to make it kind of a prominent rallying cry, at least for conservatives, for a while. No, I think that it would, but I think that that would be unfortunate for the conservative movement, right? It's almost like a bait and a trap <laughs> that I think that right. they'll fall into. I think that they will, 
literally take that case and try to make it a rallying cry. And then I think that that will have a harmful effect in the long run for the movement and for the Republican Party, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Not that they won't do it, that they will almost certainly do that, and that would be bad. <laughs> so I'm really hoping that there's not some sort of a sweeping decision for that reason, you know, as a conservative who doesn't want to see the brand tarnished any further. But also, you know, one thing that we had talked about before the show was about um, Karl Rove and his prediction that by 2016, you know, even Republican candidates will be supportive of gay marriage. And I do believe that that's also a pipe dream, that that's not realistic. It took until, you know, this last election for even Democrats, who have obviously been very supportive of LGBT rights for a long time, to even formally say that they were for gay marriage. So I just don't think that the Republican Party, for all the young people, for all the people in the party who really, again, don't care about gay marriage so much. It's just not an issue for them. They're fine with it one way or the other. Um, even with all of that momentum, I still think that the Republican Party wouldn't come out in favor of gay marriage by the next presidential election. I think that uh, you're absolutely right that Karl Rove's statement is basically a pipe dream. Um, I think it's 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 pretty funny coming from Karl Rove, whose uh, electoral strategy in 2000 and 2004 was galvanizing religious activists and actually kind of organizing voting drives through church groups um, and actually using the prospect of a pro-traditional marriage constitutional amendment to really rally conservatives to vote for George W. Bush. Um, but obviously, I mean, we've seen that Karl Rove is about elections, not about policy. Um, and I think that since 2004, since Karl Rove was the architect of, of Republican national electoral victories, um, it's we've seen kind of a peak in, in support for gay marriage where it's become more of a liability than a positive for any candidate running for national office. Um, and so, and even, and so conservatives in the future and Republicans in the future will have to balance um, Republican primary voters who are certainly more anti-gay marriage than the population at large and their promises to conservative primary voters with general election voters. And I think that um, conservative primary voters haven't shown much movement, opinion movement on this issue at all. So it's going to be very difficult for them to balance that in 2016. Well, I think in federal elections, but not the presidential election, it will be a lot easier because it depends on what state you're from. For instance, you know, Richard Tice in Massachusetts, he was openly gay Republican. He almost won his race. He was very close. It's Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, you can be an openly gay Republican. In fact, you know, you probably are more likely to win as a Republican if you're openly gay in a state like Massachusetts. Then you have a lot better chance at, at holding an issue like that close to your heart and being an activist on it uh, and, and still being able to win. But if you look at nationally, I think that it's a lot more difficult, like you said, in some of these primary states and some of these more red states um, to win on the issue if you are openly pro-gay marriage. So I think that what you'll see probably in the next presidential election is either this. Either you have the Marco Rubio approach, who's a very possible, you know, eventual nominee in 2016, who straight out says, you know, I believe the marriage is between one man and one woman, and that doesn't mean I'm disrespectful of gay gay people. This is just what my religious beliefs, you know, inform me, and this is how I feel. And he's very respectful about it. Or you'll see a candidate who, who says, kind of like Mitt Romney did last election, you know, this is a state's rights issue. I don't believe this is a federal issue, so it doesn't really matter what my opinion is on it one way or the other, because this should be left up to the states, and if the states want to pass legislation saying that you can get gay married, great. Right, I think um, the state's rights issue is an interesting one for Republicans. Uh, I think, I'm not sure it's the right argument to make. Uh, it might be the most consistent and kind of classically conservative argument in that, you know, as um, popular opinion sways slowly, it crests, and, and more and more states legalize it until it is basically normal. Um, 
Do we really sound but, that nerdy, Kevin, when we make the states' rights argument? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not about nerdiness, actually. No, um, I think that the the word states' rights has uh, certain negative uh, connotations with some of the minority of communities that obviously Republicans are trying to push to win over in the future. I mean, that's possibly true, but that's really sad if that's true, because states' rights is a key part of the Bill of Rights and a key part of the Constitution. The fact that, you know, the federal government can't tell the residents of a state what to do. And I, I really do think it's sad if it's getting, you know, a bad rap, because that's honestly one of my favorite parts of the Constitution is that the states don't have to do what the federal government uh, don't have, or at least they can make their own rules if the federal government hasn't already ruled on that. I think the fact that states are a great place for experimentation with legislation is fantastic. And I think if you've seen with all the Republican governors who are doing great things in their states with spending and budgeting and, and a whole host of other issues um, that the, you don't see the federal government doing, I think that, that that would be positive. I guess give it a positive route for states' rights. Right, I think that that's usually why conservatives try to frame it as, as federalism versus the word states' rights. Um, mm -hmm. Now, something that uh, might be a little more, uh, I think, interesting for conservatives to talk about is uh, what kind of the Rand Paul approach to uh, gay marriage at this point. And that is um, a, a sentiment that I've seen around it sounds more libertarian, but I've actually seen a lot of conservatives making it, is that we should get the, quote-unquote, get the government out of marriage. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts on that, because that kind of strikes me as a really bad argument for conservatives to make. Yeah, I think that that's a tough one legally, and I'm not a legal expert. Let's start there. I didn't go to law school. But for me, it seems like that would just realistically be very tough legally because if the government completely got out of marriage, I mean, that would really include an overhaul of many federal laws and the tax code and all of that jazz. So I think that that would be almost more sweeping of a, some sort of a decision than uh, the alternative. I don't know that personally I could be supportive of that sort of an idea. <laughs> um, but I do also tend to agree that marriage is sort of a, a religious institution that was sort of adopted by the state to help categorize people. And potentially if there's another way to do that and completely take marriage out of, out of, uh, out of the realm altogether, I'd be willing to listen to it, but I don't think they've developed the argument enough yet, right? So, okay, we get rid of marriage, then what? You know, what what, right. what comes after that? Right, and uh, I mean, I saw actually, I was talking with a friend who, who was making this argument, I told him I didn't quite buy it, um, and he said, you know, nowhere in the Constitution uh, does the government have, the federal government have the power to define what a marriage is, and therefore, by the Tenth Amendment, it should be a state's issue, and I said, well, that does that mean that uh, the federal tax status for marriage is unconstitutional? And, it, and, and in your opinion, is it unconstitutional to treat uh, married couples differently in the tax code than single, single people? And he said, yes, I think that's unconstitutional. And I think that that's where this get the government out of marriage argument falls apart. Um, right. Cons conservatives think that there is an important role for the government to play in promoting marriage, in promoting, promoting stable households, in promoting two-parent families. Um, and usually uh, what we've come to do is, is use the tax code for that, is to say, right. you know, there's a, there's a tax subsidy for being married, there's a tax subsidy for having children, um, there's a tax subsidy for um, uh, having, uh, having, well, we treat certain tax credits differently if you're married than if you're single, like the earned income tax credit. Um, right. And I think that conservatives should say that there's an important role for the government to play in that form of marriage. Um, and I think that Jonathan Last's book, What to Expect When No One's Expecting, that came out recently, is excellent on this. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of about how conservatives sh should promote 
uh, stable two-parent households, uh, and it kind of it doesn't really talk about uh, what what sex each parent would be, but about the benefits to children of uh, having a two-parent household, and I think that that is a kind of social policy for the GOP and for conservatives moving forward that can relate that we can relate to Americans a lot better. Yeah, I I mean I think that taxes is a really great way to get Americans uh, riled up. I I completely agree with you on that subject. But uh, you know both you and I are engaged. I don't uh, I'm not 100 percent familiar for, with all the tax codes. But as the tax code is set up, doesn't it currently cost you more money to file your taxes if you get married? Or am I remembering that wrong? Okay, so there's a at a certain level uh, there's a there is a marriage penalty for uh, filing as married. Um, and that's usually if you're middle to upper middle class and both, uh, both members of the marriage make approximately the same amount of money. Um, right. Then there's a or if problem. you happen to be, you know, now I wouldn't say upper to middle class, but you just happen to live on the East Coast or in a big city where, you know, there's tons of inflation, I would say, <laughs> as well. You know, I wouldn't consider myself and my fiancé upper middle class in any way, but as you <laughs> can attest, rent, everything in D.C. is really expensive, and so as a, as a result, you know, a lot of us get paid a lot more than really we're actually getting paid, right? If I lived in Kansas and I had this amount of money, I would be considered rich, but living in D.C. with the amount of money that I have, I would definitely consider myself <laughs> not poor, but, you know, definitely not well off, and so that's one of the things that is is a problem, I think, for a lot of people. So as the tax system is currently set up, right, I basically will get penalized when my fiancé and I get married. So I think that if we wanted to use the tax code better, right, as a better argument for, for the marriage situation in response to, to some of the libertarians' arguments, then I think we'd have to get rid of the marriage penalty as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's certainly an issue that conservatives can, I think, um, rally around. Although that's a... The marriage penalty, like I said, it's a fairly, sm I'm pretty sure it's a fairly small band of incomes that suffer the marriage penalty, and it doesn't sure. really affect all that, all that many Americans. For the, I'm just saying the that there's people. other, you know, I'm saying that, that if, that when one domino falls, that there's other dominoes that would also fall, and I think that that would be one of them. If we want to argue, okay, you know, fine, well, we should keep it because of these tax things, and, and conservatives would support marriage, et cetera, et cetera, and I think that once you get that far to the argument, we we as conservatives also have to really look at look at some of those issues and come up with some better answers too. <laughs> right, right. Um, now, getting back to the Supreme Court cases today, to me today is a much more important uh, case because I think that uh, judging f both from the judges' uh, arguments yesterday, which, as we know, can, is a very bad method of predicting, as we saw last summer with. Uh, the Affordable Care Act Supreme Court case, but from the judge's arguments yesterday and from the potential repercussions of uh, how they could rule on Prop 8, I think we're going to see a relatively narrow uh, ruling that, that might only affect California. Um, mm -hmm. Today's case, which is United States versus Win Windsor on um, the Defense of Marriage Act, could be much larger in, at least in scope and in kind of movement for gay marriage, um, if they if they strike down Section Three of DOMA, then uh, the federal government will recognize the marriages of uh, gay people in states where marriages are legal, uh, which would I think I think it, it's up to nine states at this point, um, and that would entitle them to. Uh, military spousal benefits, it would entitle them to social security benefits, um, and I think that social conservatives should be a lot more wary that that ruling is going to go against them than the Prop 8 ruling. Um, I think it's hard to get a ruling in this case that's going to be positive for conservatives, because almost every outcome is negative for conservatives in this, in this case. Even think, if it just you, narrowly applies, right, to California, it still sets precedent for the rest of the country. Uh, right. And that's a, you know, that's a problem. Even if it says that, oh, just in these states that ban same-sex marriage, but they allow everything but the word marriage. 
um, then that, and that's con unconstitutional, then that I think also sets up, you know, a future precedent uh, for every other state. So I, I really don't see, I don't know, maybe you disagree, but I don't really see how this turns out great for conservatives, no matter what kind of ruling we get, other than, you know, just straight up gay marriage is unconstitutional at the end. No, 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 no. I would say, I would say actually, if you're a conservative who is for gay marriage, let's say, I think mm. that this case is a much better outcome for you because you, if the federal government just says, we're going to recognize, uh, gay marriages that have been uh, approved by the states, then that's, I would think, uh, uh, more of a state's rights issue. You know, it says uh, Massachusetts recognizes gay marriage. And so in Massachusetts, if you're, if you're gay married, uh, you're entitled to the same federal benefits of the tax code that come with marriage. Um, but if you're in, but Alabama still controls kind of how marriage is defined in Alabama. Um, no, I specifically meant for traditional marriage conservatives. Sorry, I forget now that we're arguing about two different totally strands of conservatism, the people who are okay with gay marriage and the people who aren't. Right, right, I was right. specifically talking about for people who are for traditional marriage and you're conservative. I, that's what I don't see a great outcome for. Right. I think, yeah. I think that, that they should definitely be more wary that this is going to go against them. Um, mm -hmm. but, but even the most, well... I'm not entirely sure on this, but I'm, I'm fairly sure the most radical ruling that the Supreme Court could make in DOMA um, wouldn't have the same impact that a radical ruling in the Prop 8 case would. I don't think that they, are, they would be able to, unless they really stretch the bounds of their jurisdiction, would be able to just say uh, any, any state against gay marriage has made an unconstitutional law. Um, so we're striking down everything. I think that that's more of a, that's more of a concern in the Prop 8 case, not in the Doma case. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with you completely. So I'm a little bit nervous to see how this all turns out. And we won't know till June. That's the worst part, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I actually, I, I, I think that some people aren't really familiar with how uh, Supreme Court cases work. It seems like they were expecting a ruling yesterday. And, you know, <laughs> they're not getting it until late June. Um, but it's certainly going to define, both of these, these cases are going to define the terms of gay marriage going forward. You know, if the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court uh, upholds Prop 8 and upholds DOMA, uh, then activists for gay marriage will have a lot more work to do. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if, if they do, if the Supreme Court does anything other than that, anything marginally more in favor of, of legalizing or, or at least equalizing legal treatment of gay marriages, um, then that, that's going to, I think that's just another kind of clump of snow to add to the snowball that is gay marriage rolling down the hill right now. Well, I think that the timing of the cases in the Supreme Court are very interesting in the sense that, you know, we just had a presidential election. And so, literally, there's four more years until a new president is elected. And so, if this does go, you know, I guess as gay activists would call it, the wrong way for them, then they have a pretty long time to build up support for the issue before we really have to discuss it nationally again. Right, right. Um, well, I think we've covered all the ground that we can cover on that. Um, what I did want to ask you about is uh, on sequestration, um, which was a huge issue about a month ago and does not seem to be much of an issue right now. Um, <laughs> and Jim Tankersley in the Washington Post had a piece on some conservative economists and conservative activists kind of trumpeting the non-impact of sequestration um, in that, you know, consumer demand still seems strong, the economy seems to be, to be fine, you know, there's no disasters that have happened, the stock market is fine. Um, the the larger global economic impact right now is certainly happening in Europe. Um, do you think that it's do you think that it's appropriate right now for conservatives to kind of say, "Hey, look, these across the board cuts that the White House warned us about were going to be terrible. Uh, haven't done anything. You know, there aren't long lines at the airports. Nobody really noticed. Nobody cares." 
Uh, so this is just going to be more ammo for us to say we need more government spending cuts. I think that's jumping the gun a little bit for the simple fact that even though the sequestration went into effect March 1st, the government was required to give federal employees 30 days notice before they furloughed them. So the bulk of the cuts, the ones that will really make the long, the, the lines long at the airport, all the things that the Obama administration is claiming could happen, wouldn't happen until April 1st anyway. And I'm not saying that those things are going to happen. I think the administration uh, grossly exaggerated on a bunch of those things. But I think that by claiming victory before April 1st, or, or rather before the middle of April when we've really had a chance to see what's going to happen, I think would be the wrong strategy for conservatives. Um, I think it would be much better to wait a couple weeks, and then we can jump up and down when you know none of the awful, evil things that the Obama administration said were going to happen don't happen. So what's the, what is the jump up and down day for conservatives? April 15th is a tax day? I, yeah, I mean, why, it could be tax day. Why not tax day? I think that's what, you know, Grover Norquist and ATR and a bunch of the other groups will do, will use tax day to say is, is, you know, look, look, you know, the federal government's taking all this tax money from you, and what is it for? What is it to pay for? We just cut, you know, billions of dollars, and look, nothing bad happened, so let's cut billions more and give you some of your tax money back. Um, yeah, I actually, and in... In the Washington Post, again, I keep quoting the Washington Post. I guess I read it because I'm a Beltway <laughs> insider. Um, yesterday, there was an article on uh, kind of the blunted impact of the payroll tax increase in that uh, there have been very little economic effects, at least visible economic effects, from the payroll tax increase in on, on January 1st. Um, and it was kind of theorizing that people don't notice the payroll tax cut or increase because it's just... It's a line on their paycheck. All they see is the is the amount they get at the end, and two percent doesn't really do all that much. Um, and this might kind of play in the sequestration. You know, we don't, for the most part, we don't see the effects. Uh, you right. Know, we don't see we don't see that uh, an IRS worker took a vacation, uh, took a furlough day this week. Um, right. We don't see that. Uh, well, we might jump up and down for joy when the TSA gets furloughed, but we don't see that at the at the airport all that much. Um, right, most people so, aren't Beltway insiders, jet setters, right, who have to fly around the country once once a week because they're a member of Congress or, or, or whatnot, because, um, you know, a lot of people in D.C. spend a lot of time at the airport, but I think before I moved to D.C., I maybe went to the airport once a year, and that was for family vacations, and so mm -hmm. I might not notice whether or not the TSA lines were longer or not, even if they did actually get longer, right? Or the flights right. were somehow more discombobulated. I wouldn't really notice that if I didn't live in D.C., quite honestly. But to, to see you a, a D.C. insider, I guess, and raise you one, there was a poll from Rasmussen that came out yesterday that said that only 12% of Americans feel the effects of the sequestration and that more than half of Americans said that it hadn't affected them at all. And I think right. that's what it really comes down to is, you know, at least half of Americans have said they don't see it. And 12% is actually, you know, quite a small, small number, especially when you take a margin of error into account. Right. And um, the, I think that the ability of conservatives to kind of claim a victory obviously will get stronger as, as the year goes on. And if we do or don't see economic effects, um, but I think that the kind of ability for the federal government to spread out the cuts over, obviously, the course of one or two years, which is when it's, it's really taking effect, uh, is, a, I mean, if you're, if you're majorly against what ha the kind of spending cuts that happen in sequestration, you would want to make those as visible as possible. Right. Um, because you would say that even though the economic effects are largely invisible, they're there. And even if you're not feeling them, they're still there. Um, Which is what the Obama administration has tried to do so far, right? They obviously could have cut from other areas within the specific programs. 
the, I mean, the sequestration said they had to cut certain amounts from specific agencies, but it did not say where in the agencies they had to take the cuts from. Very clearly, they are trying to take them from the most obvious places like White House tours and, and whatnot because they really want to, you know, get the guilt trip, the guilt factor working, right, to, to work against Republicans because it's supposedly Republicans' ideas for the sequestration. And I think that's a, a huge point is that the cuts don't necessarily have to come from those places. And I think that even if they, they do they do take them from those places and then it, it doesn't turn out the, the way they want it to, right, Americans still really aren't that worried about it, still don't really notice that much. I think that's going to be a really bad loss for Democrats in terms of, you know, an issue that they blew up, they made a huge deal about, and then it didn't turn out the way they wanted it to. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, the fe federal budgeting is a fairly complicated issue. Um, so I don't think it's as easy as uh, the Obama administration can just say where they want to cut and where they don't want to cut. I think that they're a little more limited in in what they can and can't do, but it's certainly the case that um, having high profile things like White House tours shut down, uh, I guess, helps the White House's case. Though we haven't, like I said, we haven't really seen a groundswell of popular uh, outrage that sequestration has taken effect at, and people's lives have been affected, et cetera, et cetera. I also think it's backfiring on them, too, though. I mean, the response to the White House tours getting shut down wasn't, oh, my gosh, this is all Republicans' fault. It was literally, why is Obama shutting down the White House tours? And I think that's partially because the Republicans were good at messaging the issue, but also because, I mean, that was people's natural response. So I think that that one, at least that one, is backfired on them, and, and maybe some of these other ones will, too. Right. And I, I would say... At this point, and like you said, we won't really see uh, the effects of sequestration until the month of April. Um, but, you know, no one has seen delays at the airports. No one has seen flights getting canceled. No one has seen the, the kind of Armageddon scenario that the White House tried to portray before uh, it went into effect. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, like, you know, like I said, we'll just have to wait, I think, a little bit more until the middle of April uh, to really to see those effects those effects happen um, because I think that where the furloughs are involved is really where it will hit average Americans uh, the most either because someone in their family was furloughed because of this or because they start to see the effects um, I guess in, in institutions and organizations and processes that they use because someone was furloughed and as a result right. they don't get something they need and it might be a little hard for uh, the White House to argue, kind of, these are, even if they're really poorly spread out, they are very small cuts across the board. Mm -hmm. And we saw this past week, um, the, the, well, CBS News uh, made a FOIA request from the IRS for uh, this promotional video they made, and it cost them, you know, $60,000 to make this Star Trek parody that was just horrendously bad, um, and as they admitted, had no training value whatsoever. <laughs> it just looked like, you know, some, some fanboys at the IRS in Maryland came up with this script and they made this little film, seven minute film, and it cost them $60,000. Um, and even the IRS, which we would all say, especially right now during tax season, we would all say we don't want IRS workers getting furloughed, we want our, our, our refunds back. Uh, we can still point to the IRS and say, hey, there's a lot of waste going on here. <laughs> well, I did my taxes early, Kevin, just, you know, just in case. So I already got my refund. Everything's been processed, direct deposited. So, you know, furlough the IRS workers. <laughs> right. Exactly. So that's, that's the heartless conservative I got mine. So uh, the rest of you can, can deal with it. <laughs> Should have done, um, done them early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's all we have for today. Uh, thanks a lot, Francesca, for, for joining me on Blogging Heads. <laughs> thanks for having me. It was a good time. All right. See you next time.